Hi, everyone. Um, it's so great to see you here. I'm looking through the participants list, and it's great to see some familiar names. Um, I know we can't see you, but you can see us. I hope you are all doing good. Um, Thank you for sharing your energy and time with us today. Um, a very, very warm and caring welcome to you and anyone or anything that, that joins you with us. Um, just to give a little bit of an introduction to me so you know who it is that is speaking. Um, my name is Kanishka Sikri. I am a PhD candidate at York University, which is based in Toronto, Canada. Um, and much of my work is speculating on violability, um, which is really the ways that certain lives and lands are marked to the possibility of violence. And violence for me is always epistemic in nature. So I'm always thinking about how violence is made and remade, configured through how we speak, how we think, what we know, what we think we know, and all that good stuff. Um, so I'm here with you today. I'm wearing a blue shirt. I have a few pink flowers on my shirt. I have light brown skin and I have big, big hair, which will inevitably get more frizzy and more big throughout the session. Um, I have this mountainy painting as my background, which is part of the Met's open access collection. Um, it helps give some um, contrast to my face or else my beige face blends in with my beige background. Um, but I'm based in Toronto and I'm here to moderate the first session in Sparks Knowledge Equity discussion series. And today our conversation with these wonderful panelists um, is centered around examining the roots of universities in slavery and anti-Black racism. So just so you know, as you probably know through the registration, this is a four part series um, and our next discussion is going to be on August 10 and there we're going to be kind of thinking about the ways that research and education systems um, reflect the kind of histories of colonialism. So we will obviously be carrying the threads from this session with us, but I hope we can also carry the sorts of questions and possibilities that the panelists are evoking, that you're evoking um, through the Q&A function, through our learning together throughout these sessions. Um, so I, I understand a lot of you may have hesitations for how these sorts of sessions begin. I would like to settle in with an acknowledgement about the land, maybe a little bit of an unsettling about the land. And I wanna share a quote, which is from one of my favorite writers, Beth Brand, and she writes, quote, Native women write about the land, the land, the land, the land that brought us into our existence, the land that houses the bones of our ancestors, the land that was stolen, the land that withers without our love and me, end quote. I invite you today, and I also invite myself to think about the land, the ways this land is ours and not ours, the desire to own it, to be a part of it, um, yet the knowledge that it was stolen, that there is a violent theft, a rape, an invasion of the land for the many Indigenous peoples who have lived with it and the many brown and black people who are forcefully and violently brought through it. Um, the city of Toronto, which I am specifically on, both constructed as all borders are, reminds me of this gesture for acknowledgement. The city of Toronto, I don't know if folks are aware, has this sort of official land acknowledgement statement um, that they post on their website that does not mention at all the histories of violence that ground the land and its inhabitation today. The words of reconciliation, indigenous resilience, settlers, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they all hold their value as they are put in land acknowledgement statements, yet I do believe they are robbed of their genealogy and context when we have the de deliberate hesitation to name the land to name what happened on the land and what continues to take place on it. Here in Toronto, the land has been inhabited in various ways. One of those ways is protests, protests for Roe v. Wade, white protesters proclaiming some desire for freedom in a land that was literally conquered to give them it. The Pope has come not far from Toronto um, and there have been many hesitations as well as many desires for reconciliation that are happening. The CBC, a local news outlet here, writes that many Indigenous communities are cautiously optimistic about the Pope's arrival in Edmonton. And I want to just read a part of his apology to Indigenous communities in his speech where he says, Quote, to remember the devastating experiences that took place in the residential schools hurts, angers, causes pain, and yet it is necessary. The land is being contested here and it's also being hurt. 
rich men flying 14 minutes from Toronto to Hamilton. This hurts the land as is celebrating Canada Day, but there are also many ways that this land is being loved and cared for. I am from Toronto, so can speak for this specific context in which I work and talk and speak, um, but I encourage you to think about the lands in which you are on um, operates and how certain contestations and live in your experience on it. So it was a lot. I know I'm a quick talker, but I want to kind of get us into things. And we're here today in this particular moment. Um, and there are ways I want to sort of flag the space so that your participation can be as immersive as you would like. There is a live transcript currently being generated, and there is a Zoom recording and transcript that will be shared with you afterward. There is no chat function. There is a Q&A function for you to share any questions as you feel fit. I'm sure you're Googling the panelists. You Google them. You have questions for them, so you're free to put them in the chat whenever you would like. Um, we will take constructive questions and incorporate it into the conversation, um, which remains itself a dialogue in it. So it's really a space that can keep its elasticity when needed, but also its specificity when desired. So you're free to pose questions that are productive and meaningful for you. Time permitting, we'll also do a rapid Q&A for those favorite oddball and random questions you may have that I also love. Um, just a reminder, though, for your registration, you know this, that we also have study groups to organize around and beyond these sessions. And uh, wonderful resources were created by Sophia Lung, which were shared with you beforehand. So you're free to organize those groups amongst yourself with those resources as guides. So let's, I'm um, looking through my notes. I think it's time we can enter the session in itself. I'll just speak for a few minutes on behalf of SPAR to give you some glimpses into the motivations for today's session. Um, I think all the time these conversations are necessary, but particularly now in this moment um, is very unique with these sets of people. So Spark recognizes that in order for systems of open research and open education to meaningfully advance equity and not reinforce injustices in new ways, it is important to explicitly recognize the ways racism, colonialism, and other forms of discrimination are built into the foundation of academic systems. For Spark, this is the core of this discussion series. It is essential that openness is pursued intentionally to center equity, and that includes understanding, acknowledging, and addressing how inequ inequities were built into current systems. Our current systems are not inequitable by accident, and our approach to open research and open education needs to be responsive to this. So we have a breath of selves here with us today, and I have the pleasure of introducing them. Dorothy Berry is the digital curator for the National Museum of African American History and Culture. She was previously digital collections program manager at Harvard University's Houghton Library, where she worked to enhance access and discovery of primary sources related to African American life. I'm sure I've mispronounced some stuff already. Chandra Walker is the associate director for instruction and research services at Georgia College. Her research interests include the recruitment and retention of diverse librarians and organizational development within the library. Kurt Von Dack is assistant dean and professor at the University of Virginia. He co-chaired the UVA President's Commission on Slavery and the University, co-chairs the UVA President's Commission on the University and the AIDS Segregation, and serves as managing director for the University's Studying Slavery Consortium. That was a lot of facts. That was a lot of stuff. I don't expect you to memorize it, of course, but I hope it provides some context for you to get to know um, these various speakers today. And again, their work intersects with one another, but also hurts a diversity of threads. So you're free, again, to use the Q&A function when you feel appropriate to incorporate any questions you may have. And Kurt, Chandra, and Dorothy, I invite you to, you know, situate yourself in your responses as you feel fit. Um, that is totally up to you, and I'm sure the responses will give some more context to you and your work. Um, so I keep saying, let us begin, and then I keep talking more, so let us really begin. Um, I have been thinking for a while and it's sort of a space to depart from, um, and I think we can begin from a recognition. Um, the university is built on an archive of knowledge, on preserving knowledge, studying knowledge, learning from it, creating it. How is this archive and library from which the university is built rooted in slavery? 
What are the contexts, the genealogies, the histories of the ways anti-Black racism is lived today? I think Chandra will start at you whenever you feel ready. You're just muted. I should probably start by unmuting myself. Thank you for that. And thank you for your warm introduction and for setting us up. So I think one of the things is very important for us to do, um, particularly when talking about the library and archive um, and in dealing in library information science, very often we sort of divorce our work from the larger narrative as it relates to higher education in the United States. And so what has transpired within LIS in terms of anti-Black racism cannot be divorced from anti-Black racism in higher education. Um, if we really um, unpack that, we will recognize that for hundreds of years, Black people were pretty marginalized in terms of access to higher education and really only gained access through um, historically Black colleges and universities, which we start to see around the 1860s uh, or so with uh, Wilberforce and Cheney State University being founded. Um, and so if you kind of sort of start there and you think about the function of the library and function of the archive, um, it, it provides a nice um, segue in into how we and why we find ourselves at this particular juncture um, today. Thanks, Chandra. We'll move to Dorothy when you feel ready. I think for me, um, the foundational phrasing and framing of looking at how archives relate to the history of slavery in the university is to move away from uh, any sort of conceptual archive or metaphorical archive. I think that those sort of going to what Chandra is saying, divest um, the university from its physical institution and the physicality and the materiality that relates very directly to enslaving people for physical and material, both physically for labor and material as chattel. So for me, um, thinking of those connections and the relationship of archive, a lot of that is the evidentiary relationship and um, the ways that archives help us discover both, you know, the university's connections in the literal senses um, of agendas and charts and things about how many enslaved people a single student can bring to campus with him, uh, you know, specifically with him uh, for his valet, or the larger questions of how much of special collections in libraries are built on the idea of rarity and historiosity around holding papers and holding materials that relate directly to um, the experiences of enslaved people that are not connected with those universities as institutions. Definitely, and Kurt, you're working within an institution as well, so we'll pass that on to you when you feel ready. Fantastic. Thank you. I, this is just to, I think, add on to what both Chandra and Dorothy already said. I'm really struck by, I'm thinking here of Craig Wilder's words from 2013 in his seminal work, Ebony and Ivy, where he argued, I think correctly, that universities represent the third pillar of civilizations based on bondage. And so it should be no surprise that universities, particularly in the North American context, um, have this history embedded in their archives, embedded in their landscape, embedded in their built landscape, and embedded in the communities they are situated in. Um, so it's, <clears throat> to me, it's just an, an no surprise, right? They, I, I'm here at the University of Virginia. This was the largest population-wise um, slave state in the United States when the university was founded. It was founded in a county where over half of the population for the first 50 years of the school's existence were people held in bondage. So it should be no surprise that the literally the very bricks used to build the university were the clay was dug from the earth. And right, they were shaped by bricks. I actually had a student earlier this summer find one of the bricks with a child's handprint on it. So it's it's just there hidden in plain sight if you know where to look for it. And even the archives, and this is speaking as a historian, not as an archivist, but when you go into the archives, this story is everywhere in the archives, but it's it you have to read the archive very carefully for two reasons, right? Those collections. 
uh, privilege, right? The, here in the United States, it's white elite property owners, which in the context of a slave state is people who enslave people. So it privileges their records and their stories. But th those materials are often chock-a-block with reference to slavery and the experiences of Africans and African Americans in the United States. But you have to really read them very carefully and know where to look. And you face another hurdle in terms of how that material was often cataloged at an earlier time. So I, I know I now, I have to pay attention to the name and figure out where they lived and what they did to know whether or not in what seems like a benign collection of family papers, I'm actually going to find incredible detail about this uh, story here. So I, it, it, again, no surprise the story of slavery and of uh, anti-Black racism. And I think it spills beyond that. And this is, can you just get to your comments when we started? Uh, this work may start with slavery and um, anti-Black racism in institution, but you very quickly find you have a lot of other stories of oppression that uh, need to be told and unpacked. Thank you, Kurt and Dorothy and Sandra. I think that really, sets us off into thinking about this archive, not just as this physical archive, of course, um, that has these absences and that has these misrepresentations, but these physical absences that we see in the archive um, must be worked and dealt with emotionally. We need to find ways to read those absences in different ways. So Dorothy, in, in particular, your work sits within the intersections of information discovery and African-American history. Um, and you know, clearly from our conversations, what we consider to be the sort of objective knowledge, as you spoke a bit about, um, is made through these histories of bondage, theft, incomplete narratives, that which is literally lost at sea. And the many people who don't even make it into the physical archive that we're talking about, how do you work with this knowledge archive that is so incomplete and so often misrepresented? You know, to Kurt's point, how do we work with the archive silences? How do we read the stuff that we cannot see in it? So for me, um, I kind of take a different, a different view of archives in university contexts and that I don't think of them generally as having silences or as being incomplete. Um, I think they are very loud about what is important to them and they are very complete about their choices. And so I think that from a historian or just a generalized humanity standpoint, I completely understand conceptualizing absence because there are voices that are not there in a larger historical record sense. But again, I think that that um, lets the institution off the hook when I say that there is an absence here and the absence then is rectified by acquisition. The absence is rectified by purchasing more things so that now we can say to faculty, actually we have more black voices from the 19th century because we bought more things, but that's not really the question that we're talking about. And then even the idea that there are things that are you know, incomplete or not represented properly, you know, we make all of these standards, nothing that is happening in universities or libraries is you know, dropping down from the ether. So if I'm saying, you know, a family's papers are not described well because it doesn't mention that their largesse um, is based on enslaving people. I mean, that's that's not a thing where it's not an absence, it's not a silence, it's a choice. And a lot of times we say these things are cataloged really far in the past. Yeah, like 1997. It's not like it's not that far. Um, and the re and even contemporary ones. And it's again, I think this ways that we avoid looking at a lot of the bigger picture things. Why are a lot of these collections described this way? Because the people that you know fund our universities now are related to the people who have a big family collection in the libraries. And we don't wanna say, you know, great, great, great grandson of donor. We're choosing to describe this collection in a way that reflects a different side of your family. <laughs> and I guess, yeah, so I'm just very, in I always, have an interest obviously as like a living being in the human side of all these discussions but I also think there's something really important about 
the institutional sides, the economic sides, the structural sides that we can allied when we talk about um, so much about absence in things where they were never meant to be voiced. So families' papers, and they never talk about the people they owned or they do in that um, sort of classic ways that are avoidant. You know, a lot of uh, women's diaries of uh, female enslavers will talk about servants in their household, even though they knew that they were not uh, what we would call a paid servant, which is a thing that we were aware of at the time as well. Uh, you know, but that's not a silence. It's not an absence. It's a loud, resounding clarity. Wow. Wow. It is so difficult, I think, to speak about um, you know, that that which we cannot see without using this language of absence and silence um, is something that I'm I'm thinking a lot about too. And, and all you said, that was just so provoking for me. Um, I want to take this to Kurt because I think that Kurt, you are, you know, historian working in public, as you say, and you're specifically rooted in academia as well. Um, like how, how do we work with this archive? Like what is the best practices of working with an archive that, makes these deliberate choices and has these deliberate decisions and habits and practices that allow for certain things to be not there, that prioritizes certain things and leaves things completely obliterated from it. How do we work with this archive in the university? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm chuckling because I think this is a work in progress. I, I, I had 10 years into the research project here at the university, I'm still figuring out exactly how to do that. I, I will say, and this is speaking particularly from the work I'm doing at one university, I know I've really been, I've benefited from working closely with the archivists at our university who are right now, I think, dedicated to doing something a, a little different, right? They're really working on decolonizing the archives making all of this material that is, is again, I, the phrase I always use is hidden in plain sight, right? It's not silent, it's not absent, but if, if you don't know where to look, you can easily miss it. Making all of that really visible uh, in, in cataloging um, uh, and digitization in the uh, interpretive exhibits the, the library puts on, right? Really forefronting the collections that already exist there so that they now publicly tell a different story. Um, I think that the second piece is, again, just really remaining sensitive to the ways in which this material is sitting there and, and you have to read it carefully to actually find the, the story. And I, I love it, Dorothy, you mentioned servants, right? It, it, what we see is laborer, servant, and hand, which I think so speaks to, right? That's speaking very loudly about what bondage is, right? It's reducing a human being to a, a machine, to a thing, a tool that you use. And you have to know how to look for this. And if, if you don't do that, you're going to pass right over really detailed information about enslaved people at the university or about where the money is coming from um, for a university. So be really sensitive to that. And, and I think the last piece is as a uh, historian working in public, it's about uh, questions of framing and interpretation. And the first thing you have to do is kind of flip the script, right? You can't let those documents speak as they want to speak. So you have to turn that story around and peel out the servant and tell the story of the servant in that letter from the perspective of the servant as best you can. And again, you're not gonna use the word servant when you do this. You're gonna speak explicitly about right, people held in, in bondage, enslaved people. Uh, I think as well, and this varies from institution to institution, but it, it's, not, it, it's not the university story to tell, right? It, it, we have to do the finding and the telling the truth and getting it out there. But at some point, we need help. Predominantly white institutions, historically predominantly white institutions, shouldn't be in the business of finding the story and telling these stories as if they're theirs to tell. So uh, we've worked really hard on kind of a long-term community engagement to talk to the people in the local area who often are descended from the very people we are pulling out of the archives and ask questions about right, how should this story be told. Uh, we've even now reduced this to the kind of thing when you're putting up an interpretive panel, 
we mock up one, we do all the work, we edit, we get it to all to fit. But before we print anything, we take it to K through 12 educators, and then to, in our case, descendants and community members and get feedback. And that's part of the ongoing education that the, the things scholars use, the phrases we use, the images we use, aren't always really uh, the best methods for doing this in public. So I think that last piece is you have to sort of crowdsource framing and interpretation so that you are not perpetuating uh, the the way the university has handled these materials or thought about this history in its own past. Thank you, Kurt. I think that it's very difficult to talk about this archive in you know specific language that does not continue um, replicating the very violences that you know all of your work is trying to transform and to think about in, in different ways and, and through different means. Um, I think when we're talking about, you know, the archive, all of you as historians and librarians, you work with um, what is deliberately left out and the histories that are erased. And so I'm curious about the sort of um, work you do to deal with these sources. I mean, maybe it's the citations that you use, maybe it's the specific ways that you Kurt, as you were speaking about how you read the archive in specific ways. Um, how do we deal with this archive when the sources that are considered authoritative, that are considered legitimate, are ones that, you know, displace certain stories and that the deliberate choice not to have illegitimate sources or non-authoritative sources of what what are those and how do we deal with you know what is considered legitimate and what is not um i understand that's that's a big question as all of these are but shandra if you if you have some thoughts there about these sort of sources and, and how we can deal with them so you raise a really interesting question and as you were um sharing your question i was thinking about some of the challenges that I have faced in my own research in terms of the gaps that um, I have identified and what it has required of me to um, find the information that I actually needed to find. I will say that um, just based on my background, um, I attended a historically black a college and university. I graduated from Spelman and my master's in library science is from Clark Atlanta University. And so I think through my education and life experiences, it gave me a great deal of sensitivity for forms of knowledge and for respect for communities that are not always recognized. Um, I think personally in my own research, I've been um, able to, or willing to dig a little bit deeper. And I was gonna share this in the next question, but I'll go ahead and uh, share it now. A couple of years ago, I wrote an article about the Carnegie Library Grant Program to colleges, and I specifically, um, my purpose was illuminating the experiences of Black colleges and trying to secure those grants. And what I did was I um, got the records from Columbia University, and I looked at those uh, library grant applications, and what I noticed across reading them was the, I will call, I will call them the histronics and the contortions that Black college leaders had to um, put themselves through to try to secure those grants, the, the reading between the lines and looking for the signals and the signifiers. Essentially, what many of them had to do was uh, you had classical liberal arts colleges that had to, or felt rather, that they had to strongly identify with an industrial or vocational curriculum in order to secure that type of support. And so you um, you know, I saw that, I saw them also uh, sort of uh, using whiteness as property and uh, sharing how well they were received by the quote unquote white community as sort of a, a down payment on those libraries. So it's like, we're okay because we have white people who are, are vouching for us. So that whiteness sort of becomes like a down payment on getting these libraries. And so I think for me personally in doing my work, um, it has been looking for maybe what is not being said or, or what is missing. I will also say that a lot of times some of the gaps in the archive, the information is there, but it very, not necessarily in the archive, but it is available. Um, the archive very much reflects priorities, it reflects power, it reflects privilege. Um, and 
to Dorothy's point earlier, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that what has transpired in our archives in particular has been not been passive. It has been very deliberate. And these are very deliberate choices that have been made. You know, how people were described calling enslaved people servants, like that was a choice. That was, <laughs> that person had a choice in terms of how they describe those people. And so I think bringing that type of awareness and sensitivity to the work um, can help overcome some of those challenges. And I think even on an even simpler level than those fantastic points, just the acknowledging that an archive is a collection of unpublished, generally written documents. So thinking of that as the encyclopedic source of a historical record is, we know not everyone can write today why would we, you know, so just assuming that that would be the information, and that's always sort of the laugh about archives is, you know, you find one document and that proves something about the past, as opposed to saying that that document proves something about the person who wrote that document. We don't know if that person was, uh, you know, an example of the common thought of his time or was a wild card. You have to do a lot more research to really contextualize anything, but especially thinking of something like you know, enslaved voices missing from the archive. I mean, like there are legal reasons why enslaved voices would be far less represented. Many places illegal to teach someone to write and difficult to get paper and like sort of things that feel almost um, almost too simple to mention, but are a large part of this, not even getting into the histories of collecting, but just if you, what is the choice of the item you are collecting? you're going to have limited things. Where do you collect from? A lot of times interpersonal relationships with people who self-identify as collectors. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, if someone that of the early black writers that we know of, most likely we're not in, you know, Jupiter Hammond was not hanging out at a place like Harvard, which coexisted, <laughs> obviously. We're not giving things or even more locally, someone like David Walker, who undoubtedly wrote other things in Boston, because he would, you don't write one draft of anything. But those papers were not something he was going to say, go over to Harvard and say, please put these in your collections. And not only because that would have been, you know, bananas, but because of you know, collecting is also relationship based. And so all those things, yeah, I guess it feels like I'm harping on that same point, but I really think that this fundamentals of this is an institution that collects materials it values to be important and those materials are written documents or published documents that you know those sort of valuations are really key because we get so into the metaphorical um or like i guess the Foucaultian archive of memory that we are you know not paying attention to some pretty like straightforward reasons things are the way they are i love that there are like these very mundane sort of livings that that happen and that there are of course these structures operating at the same time but they're also um these sort of very quotidian moments and very simplistic explanations as well and that they work in these kind of um um these interconnections um i want to pivot just for a second because there's this really interesting question um in the q and a um and i think we're still kind of thinking about the sort of best practices like how do we work on this archive with this archive um with the library with the institution um and kurt this was this was kind of directed to you um when you were speaking speaking about the community um, or when you were speaking about how one wants to check in with the community right before an exhibit goes up. Um, how, how does one work? This again is a big question, but how does one work with the community that they're doing research on, um, that they're, you know, they're hoping their research impacts, um, that they're hoping, um, you know, certain histories that their research uses is a part of that community and can found, be found in the sort of living of that community now. And so how do you, and this is a big question again, how do you sort of work with the community in your work? Um, is it like a full process, like a participatory process that you engage the community when you're doing work or is it 
more towards the end, like you were saying. Um, I guess if you have any thoughts on that, I think that question was really interesting. So I, I'll do my best to answer full confession, right? When I started this work, 10 years ago, I imagined I was going to be the archive rat, right? I was going to sit down there and just sift through papers, had a very sort of like late 20th century vision of what I was going to be doing as a historian. But uh, because I represent a much larger commission, we spent about nine months debating these, these kind of deep questions about what is it that we're doing and where do we hope to get? And one of the decisions was, we wanted to make sure when we were done, the really complicated and frankly often unpleasant relationship with the university to the community it's been embedded in, a community that the university is often in some ways dominated, needed to change. And if we were going to really roll up our sleeves and fully acknowledge human bondage in the university's history and maybe do more than that, that we were gonna have to do it with the community as a partner. And so I've, I've been on a 10, 10 year education in how to do this. So same thing, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner on this for the past 10 years. Uh, first thing you have to do is go out and listen, right? We, we went out as soon as we decided, okay, we're gonna do community engagement. Yep, it was, uh, it's been a sustained project. We did it for about five years. Uh, the pandemic kind of put a halt to uh, being able to effectively do it or we'd still be doing it. But you have to go out and listen, and you have to listen with humility. And I, I chuckle, right? I'm a professor. What do professors do, right? We, we claim expert knowledge, and we lecture to people. That is not how you do community-engaged work, right? It's just not. And so even when universities are well-meaning participants in a community-engaged project, they often come back to assuming expert, put on, don the expert hat, and just preach at people. So we went out and simply said, here's our charge. What do you think this means? And what should we do about it, right? And what would success look like? That's, we started there and uh, that's kind of been the mantra ever since. And at every point we would come back and say, well, here's what we've learned. Here's what we're thinking. How does this sound? And so we, we made sure that we were listening with humility um, and then responding to what we are hearing. It is really hard and messy work. I, I don't want to suggest it's easy, but I think it's the, the only way uh, inst institutions can really do this work effectively um, is to, to listen to those voices. And not only was it an exercise for me in community engagement, what you also learn is the community often already knows this story way better than the scholars and the archivists do, right? They know it. There's deep oral histories, which speaks to the kinds of sources we privilege. Um, I know when I go do a search of our library catalog and I look at it, what, what are the oral history interviews, right? They have a very distinct pattern about them that it really replicates what the uh, paper materials privilege. So we're not even doing a good, we hadn't been doing a good, job, a good job of even capturing those stories. So there's often deep community knowledge and oral history about this. And there are often, we had community scholars who told us a lot, right? We, there are entire enslaved families that were connected to the university that we know their full life stories and connected to their living descendants because someone in the community had been doing this work for two decades before we, we arrived. So um, I think that, to my sense, that that's the really, really important piece that you just have to always be listening. And, and I, it's really hard, right? You have to really listen, hear what you're being told and go back and figure out how to respond to that. And um, some of it involves the, the, the boring work of, I, I always call it telling the truth, right? That you're not successfully unraveling this history uh, if you're not representing the institution and just admitting, right? Yep, yeah, people were enslaved at the university and slavery was wrong. So you have to do that truth telling, but then you also have to listen to what's the response that comes next. And I'll, I'll end with, at our very first meeting, this is now eight years ago, nine years ago, the very first thing, 200 people at a community center, so you don't do it at your university, first person that stood up to report back said when we were asking, okay, what does this mean and where do we go, told us, you better damn well build a memorial, it better be big, it better be visible, and we better be able to get to it. I think most of the commission was thinking very differently about that process. We didn't have in mind this physical change to the landscape. Um, and so we knew right then and there that had to be an end result of this, and it was intimately tied 
to the research because it had to become a document, right? Sort of telling this history permanently in our belt landscape. The second person stood up and cried about the destruction of, they were evicted from their home in a now destroyed black neighborhood in Charlottesville in the 1980s. And this was um, to build the, the then new university hospital complex. And so there was the second piece was you can't talk about slavery as if it ended in 1865 and it doesn't profoundly shape the world we live in. So we learned the very first two, first two people who spoke who were greeted with thunderous applause, you, memorials matter, build one, tell the truth, carve it into stone, and then don't act like, don't just pat yourself on the back and go, we talked about slavery, now we're done. And I, so still trying to figure out how we tell the next hundred years of history there. Thank you, Kurt. We have a lot of interesting questions coming in. Um, and I think I just want to come back to Dorothy for a second, because I think we're still um, stuck on how, because there's, I'm thinking of a good way to word this. There's also this like fetish of, you know, working with the community and doing oral histories and, you know, the community needs to be included in what we're doing. Yet there's also that, that importance because the archive has made deliberate decisions to not include, um, you know, certain histories of enslavement and certain histories of chattel slavery. And so a question in the chat was kind of geared around this too. Um, like, how do we as archives and, and libraries sort of support the re remaking of the archive so that those histories that have been typically excluded in the collections um, can be preserved. Um, so Dorothy, I, again, these are really big questions, but um, how do we how do we go about not necessarily filling in the gaps of the archive, um, but making the archive a bit more, if I can say, full and rich with the histories that have been um, obliterated from it deliberately. I think that that goes to what Kurt was just talking about, about community feedback and hearing what people actually want. Um, because the answer to how would you work with any distinct community to make their histories more included in any distinct institution is too localized to have any answer to me, except for, you know, approach and listen to people and also open your wallet. I mean, I think those would be the two big things, the first being the most important, but just not even being willing to do the, don't even start the first if you're not willing to do the second don't start asking how can we help you know have our archive have more community voices engaged you you know what's capitalism that we live under and also maybe the engagement is we already have a community collection you could help us by donating some time when we don't necessarily have the training to do x or you could help us by paying for xyz but that again doesn't fulfill <laughs> Why don't we do a lot of that? Because it doesn't actually fill the mission of the institutional university archive. And then the other thing that I think about a lot um, is that community is a term much like archive that is can be diluted to an extent to which there's no meaning. So something like UVA working on collections about slavery at the institution and how it built the institution and then talking back to local people in the area, that's a distinct thing. Um, but when I think about a lot of the collections, for example, that I worked with at Harvard, there is no local community with a re with the direct relationship to the material necessarily. Because if you, you know, we have things that are purchased over time, they have a very large connect, the Bernard Rowe Slave Trade Collection, I think is its formal title. That is all about a slaver who worked in Richmond, Virginia. And the work of doing community work with that collection in my mind would have to be really like embedding in Richmond and figuring out the connections to research is already happening there, which of course there is a ton of research in Richmond on um, histories of enslaved people. But that sort of work is entirely separate from a perceived mission of archives. Um, but again, I think that I, for predominantly white field, I feel like the stat is still at and maybe Chandra knows better because I know that's your, it's like 83% white, I think for LIS still. 
thereabouts. Um, community has seemed to me to often become um, a, an inclusive way of saying black people or an inclusive way of saying uh, non-white people, but a lot of times just specifically black. How is the community involved in this work? And I get that, I've gotten that a lot. And I'm, especially it's a place like Harvard, I was like, the community of 18th century Philadelphia, how are they engaged? I didn't. I could talk to contemporary, feel like if, but I, talking to people contemporary, again, from these institutions, you have all these sorts of complications. And I think that, um, so I guess I would say to that big question that listening is very key. Resource, um, what is that word? Redistribution is very key, but also uh, not forefronting the emotional solve of wanting to do work that benefits the community, a term that is somewhat meaningless, but means those other than myself. Because I feel like I rarely hear wanting to work with the community. Um, I rarely hear that as actually wanting to be in community with others. So much to think about, so much to think about. Sanja, I um, I knew you went off mute for a second, so I just wanted to open up the space if you want to add anything there. Sure, I just wanted to add on to Kurt's comments earlier when he was talking about some of the work that he's done at his university. Um, I immediately thought of a quote that I heard recently, I think it's um, nothing for us without us. And um, I wanna just mention very briefly a project that I worked on, an NEH funded community, uh, Her common heritage grant. We started our work first by just listening to the community. Like, of course we had great ideas about, you know, what we thought needed to be collected and what was missing, but we paused and asked them what they thought was important. And we involved them from the very, very beginning. I think something else that we did that, that brought value to that project was that we recognized that everyone who was involved had expertise. Um, it was different. So like we had archivists, we had librarians, we had community griots, historians, but everyone's work had value. And I think um, acknowledging it from the very beginning uh, really set a strong uh, foundation for us to do our work. Um, we involved the, the community <laughs> um, at every stage of the project. Um, and I think, you know, we brought everyone tried to bring what they could to the table. So like I wrote the grant because that was something that I could do, but I needed the community to help me to, with the justification because they had that knowledge. And so that was a really, really good um, framework for us. And again, we involved them throughout the project um, and got their input. It ended up being something very different from what we thought it would ultimately become. But at the end of the day, I was very proud of it because it was what the community wanted it to be ultimately. And it reflected um, what they valued and what they thought was important. And so at the end of the day, I was I was cool with it. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many directions that we could take this and there are a lot of questions coming in as well but you know one question was kind of about the various roles um that you folks are taking up Shonja kind of being the librarian and Dorothy kind of being the archivist and, and Kurt being the historian though of course um y'all are all you know dipping into these various areas as well um but I want to start with Kurt um and just get a sense of like you know we've been talking about best practices and we've been thinking about you know ways to move forward in such a way that working with the community and, and whoever is included in what we consider the community to be that we're wanting to work with, um, how that is a potential way for us to address these roots of slavery and anti-Black racism. Um, but Kurt, what would this really look like for an academic institution as you are a historian? Um, what would it look for this academic institution to meaningfully address its roots in anti-Blackness? What would be the sort of starting point um, in this work, of course, working with the community as maybe one of those points, but if there's anything else you want to add there. Oh, there's so much, and right, that I, I, I never know where to start on this question because, again, 10 years, we're still at the beginning of answering that very question. 
Um, I, I think, and I used this phrase earlier, right? When you tell the truth, you have to step out of the typical scholarly channels for doing this, right? That the, the what people in my role would typically do is right, go to university press and publish a book, write a journal article, and right, no, th that's that's not really doing the work. So when we when we talk about telling the truth here, we think about what are the ways we can reach anybody and everybody. So yep, there's going to be books, there are going to be conferences, there are going to be meaningful rituals of remembrance that we're trying to build into the annual cycle life cycle of the university, so that it's always something we're talking about as. Right, we need to know this. We need to value it, and we should be addressing it. Um, we educate, right? This is build classes. Uh, don't just think about it as reaching students at your institution. It's engage with the community, and I love it. Uh, engage in the community is maybe a better way to put this, right? And we worked really hard to do that here. That you don't invite people to your university and say, "Look, I'm going to give you the gift of a sandwich at my university." You go out into the community and say, "I'm coming here humbly." to, again, to, to, to tell the truth and say, we're actually gonna talk about this. Um, but I think this also gets to, you have to make changes to, right? This can't just be something that sits on a shelf. There need to be exhibits. Uh, you need to rethink, right? The, the very portraiture, and this is I, I, probably both in libraries and at universities, right? Who gets a painting of them hung on a wall is, is, is directly related to the very story we're talking about. So rethinking that, rethinking right the naming and renaming of buildings, who is memorialized in space, um, putting in interpretive panels anywhere and everywhere to tell the story again, memorials large and small. Um, I think those things are really, really important. And I also think it's good to think about what are the ways that you can share this material with the broader public so that they need not visit the archive to access this. So I, I, I look at two things like open source digitization is really powerful, right? Make it public so anybody can go see it, make it easy to get to so that if, if someone in some far flung area wants to look at your materials, you have the receipts laid out. They need not come and visit the archive, digitize this material, but also make it accessible, right? It's not enough. Um, universities went through a spate of digitizing kind of newspapers and you know here at UVA if you want to go search the local paper you have to go to the day and date and go in and flip through it there's no way to search across issues right so it's not that, that's because the technology wasn't where it needs to be now and I don't think people were thinking about it the way we are now but connected to a database anything so that it's searchable and accessible um, I think those are really important. Uh, we've used social media to just like, lay the facts out. Here's the here's what we're finding, and so show the receipts. And this this pulls in a much broader audience. Or if we're going to use the plural, right? Communities. You connect with them, different sectors of the community or communities, as you do this work. Um, so I, I I really think, and what I wrestle with with these university projects is they're kind of evanescent nature, right? There's a lot of energy that's built on a group of people who are really committed to doing the work. And then everyone gets tired or the, the funding runs out and then it's gone, right? You, uh, we produced a report, many schools have produced reports. Where are they, right? They, they, they collect dust, they're not things. So how do you make it part of the living, breathing um, memory of the university and something that, right, students who come in next year will know the story. Um, I'm, again, I'm not sure I entirely have that answer, but I think those are really important that if you've not succeeded, if as soon as your project wraps up, we've just beamed back to right, uh, something that looks very similar to the moment when you started. And I think for Kurt's point that relates really well to the issues of doing work around universities' histories with slavery as a sort of, um, time-based reconciliation project. Like we have to acknowledge it now because people have realized that our university was tied to slavery. So we definitely need to put out a report. Done. And now the report exists and you can move on. But I think of work that folks have done um, in terms of long-term commitments to community that are not necessarily related to histories of enslavement, but yes, to histories of oppression. Thinking of work um, like at Arizona with a great archivist colleague and project leader, Nancy Godoy, and their community archives work that involves both archiving uh, queer Latinx 
people's materials in the region and also providing them with sometimes Spanish language, sometimes English language instructions for keeping your own papers. And you know, when funding is around to get those grants, providing them with the acid-free folders and the boxes that they might need. And similar work happening at um, National African American with the Home Movies Digitization Initiative, where folks can get their home movies digitized and receive back their originals and also receive back a digital copy that they can access at home. And then the museum archives a copy, uh, you know, with whatever permissions that have been negotiated with the families. And that kind of work, again, is very challenging always for universities, because regardless of um, our good intentions, both uh, historians and archivists and librarians are not necessarily power players at the university. Uh, and Things like well, both of the things I just mentioned are things that end up costing the like you have to pay more than what you get in terms of a valued piece of material, and we can all talk about you know the greater good and like preserving knowledge, but you know universities are businesses, and the argument of well maybe we should just give away things is kind of hard to sell up the ladder. Chandra, I want to pass this to you, but they're also really interesting questions are coming in the chat. We can't get to everything, but you know, a lot, I think a lot of folks are latching in or latching on um, to this desire to work in the community. And folks have, you know, been talking about community-based participatory research. And one question to you, Chandra, um, was the ways that you and your team engaged um, with the community. And so how do you go through the process of collaborating with somebody in the community or a specific community? How do you get input? How do you work with them? Um, how do you compensate them? Um, Dorothy mentioned retribution, sort of how do we facilitate that, that community um, based work as a way to kind of meaningfully address these, these racist roots of the library? These are also big questions as well. But if you had any thoughts there? Sure. So um, I was thinking as, again, as Kurt was talking about digitizing collections and how that can make, doing so can make them more accessible. I was thinking how that can even function on a local level in terms of the comfort and familiarity that many communities locally have with the university. If that is a campus where maybe they were not able to gain admission into the last 50 or so years, you know, they may be the ones who would access those materials um, right there in that town, but they may feel more comfortable accessing them um, via the internet than, than actually navigating that campus. Um, but to the question about how working with the community and how we got our message out in the community, it really started just with relationships, um, conversations. I will be the first to acknowledge that it's been slow work, but I think it's been meaningful work. Um, so maybe not necessarily talking about the particular project, but just talking about how you're doing or what is going on in the community or listening, um, valuing the knowledge and giving people an opportunity to be heard. That has really paid uh, dividends for us. I would also say that um, we learned through our project that for our local community, word of mouth, was the most powerful way to disseminate um, information um, about the project. So, you know, advertising the newspaper, mail, like none of that produced the benefits that just word of knowledge. Um, I also think developing trust with respected individuals in the community um, assisted us. And so if we said we were going to do something, um, you know, even if it was something not necessarily directly related to the project, but when we followed through, it showed the community members that we were committed to them and uh, it built trust. And so I think based on those relationships, other people felt comfortable with us and in working with us. And those were just some ways that, you know, we were able to um, get buy in for the, for the project. I would say I think there's a question in the chat about, um, you know, making sure that community members are compensated for that work for their work um our project was impacted by the pandemic we were supposed to wrap with a public panel um my commitment was in the same way that we were to compensate the humanities scholar for that panel was to also compensate um 
the other panelists on that community because again, you know, as I mentioned previously, we recognized that people had different expertise, but everyone's expertise was valuable. And if it's valuable, I feel like it needs to be compensated. And so um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to close out with that, but we would not ask them to come and spend their time and um, share their knowledge without acknowledging it um, in that way. Such a wonderful way to wrap up. Um, we are at the close of this se session, but one of the first questions we got, I think an another way to kind of close the conversation, if folks just want to take 10, 15 seconds and maybe list out two or three people or organization whose work could help those who are participating today learn more about, um, especially as we've been talking about, you know, community-based work. Um, if folks, maybe we'll start at Dorothy, um, if you just want to take a second to share that. Sure, um, I'll recommend a book. I say that um, They Were Her Property by Stephanie Jones Rogers is a great example of writing that goes into primary sources primarily the writings of uh, white enslavers um, and finds the way, provides you that context that helps understand how you can approach primary sources that appear to be uh, missing voices and how that's filled in through uh, historical research, which is something that kind of came up with this. What is the relationship here with historians, archivists, librarians? We may provide these sources, but historians need to do this, all this contextualizing and world building work to explain what the document is. And I think that they were her property about white women um, and slavers is a really powerful and accessible book on that. Thanks, Dorothy. Kurt, if you'd like to share some resources. So I'm, I'm not sure if this is a resource. I just keep thinking about the question about resources, right? One of the threads here is as you do this work and you engage with a community or communities, how do you commit re institutional resources to the benefit of the community? And we have not done a clear job here at UVA of linking the truth-telling projects with the other work that's the uh, resource commitment going on. But at UVA, we have the Democracy Initiative, and a piece of the Democracy, uh, Democracy Initiative is the Equity Center, which is doing community-based, right? We're, literally offices in the community, offering office space to community organizations and working directly with them on identifying what are the equity issues in our local region that need uh, developing and then committing university and resources to working to solve them. Um, and I, I, what I would like to see is right, the, draw the bright line between we've acknowledged this past that we're pulling out of the archives and talking about and go, right, here is the amends that we're doing now to take care of the, the ongoing afterlives of slavery. I don't know of any university that does that effectively right now. Um, but I think it's a model for what community engaged work might look like that's about letting the community identify the project and having the university commit resources to equity based projects. I took more than 15 seconds, sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. Chandra, we'll, we'll close off with you. Um, sure. I think you, you had really, you know, strongly um you know talked about the community so I think it's a great way to to take us out sure so I'm going to follow Dorothy's example and just mention a book that I think will be really helpful I think it's just a case study for this topic um the title of the book is um shelter in the time of storm and it's by Jelani Favors um it's a book about activism on campuses of historically black colleges and universities but I and uh Dr. Favors has spoken widely about the book he's talked about um, what he's encountered as he did the research at the various archives. And so I think if you really want to understand a lot of the issues that we've talked about today in terms of anti-Black racism and higher education and archive and history, uh, it is a wonderful case study or case studies um, about uh, some of these issues um, and just a, a fascinating read as well. So I would offer that. Thank you. Thank you. And we're, we're a little bit over, folks. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, but thank you to Shonja, Dorothy, Kurt, 
for all that we've been thinking about here. I think there are so many threads that we've been catching on and so many things that we need to continue sort of grappling with, which I'm sure the other sessions and study groups will be doing. Um, if folks have any comments, please share them. Of course, the the, the speakers here will take a look and, and it's, it's always great to hear um, what you're thinking. Um, a warm goodbye to all of you. Hope your day, your week is peaceful ahead. Um, and we hope to see you for the next session.